Hi, and welcome to today's OT Learn session um, with Dr. Karina Danza. Karina is a professional advisor for children and young people for the College of Occupational Therapists and a senior lecturer in occupational therapy at Canterbury Christchurch University. Karina's background is working with children with specific learning difficulties and school based occupational therapy practice. Her PhD research interests are in occupational therapy, student learning processes, and occupation centred occupational therapy practice with children. I'll now hand you over to Karina for today's webinar. Thank you, um, and thank you to everyone for listening in. Um, so today what I would like to talk to you about is the value of occupation centre practice. Um, and this is one of the key drivers within the College of Occupational Therapists at the moment. Um, and there are a number of reasons why we are trying to reconnect with occupation as the core of our practice. Um, and, and we're going to go through some of those reasons as, as we go through the presentation. So I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about current practice um, and also the College of Occupational Therapists' position statement and briefing around occupation centre practice. And we're going to talk a little bit about occupation centred, occupation focused and occupation based. And what are the similarities and differences between those and how might we be able to use them to be able to reflect on our practice. I'm going to talk about how occupation is proximal to uh, what the things that we do and how we can maintain occupation within our occupational therapy process. And then I'm going to talk to you about some discussion and some next steps. Um, I would recommend that if you are listening to this webinar, that um, if you are doing this as part of a group, that at certain times you pause the webinar so that you can have a discussion about some of the concepts as we're going through. Because I think it's really important to um, talk about some of the areas rather than just listen through um, this webinar as, as it stands. So if we think about current practice, first I would like uh, if you can have a think about what is the unique perspective of occupational therapy and how do we describe our role to adults or children or other professionals. It's quite interesting to think about uh, when somebody asks you, so what is it that you do and you say I'm an occupational therapist and they go, oh that's interesting, what's that? What kind of things do you say? How do you describe what it is that you do? And it's quite helpful if at this point you maybe have a little bit of a note down about what, what things you say when, when you're talking to people about what it is that we do. And what's quite interesting is how occupation, the word occupation, features in your explanation. And if it does or if it doesn't. And what we um, sometimes do, what uh, occupational therapists we, we're not always very clear about how it is that we describe our role because it is so broad. We do so many different things. And sometimes what we tend to do is talk about the tasks that we do. So we start to describe or we can give out some equipment or we can um, support people to um, re-engage in the community or we start to talk about some of the specific things that we do in our role. And one of the challenges that we have with that is that people then don't really get a clear sense of what occupational therapy is. Um, they might get a better sense of the things that, it, that you do or the things that you want to them, but actually as an overall picture of what occupational therapy is, it, it does remain a little bit unclear. The other thing that tends to happen is, is we say that occupational therapy is so diverse, which it is. Um, and it's different depending on which setting you're in. So it might be different if you're working with children, it might be different in adults, with older people, uh, within mental health or physical health or community or acute. And again, that um, might be so. that We might do some different things within our practice. But actually the overall core of what we do uh, is the same. And, and it, I think we need to start promoting, we need to continue to promote the similarities between us as occupational therapists so that we start to develop this coherent professional identity as, as a whole. Sometimes people also avoid the use of the word occupation or maybe not just, maybe not intentionally avoid it, but they don't use the word occupation because um, people get it confused with work. Um, and that is the case, like people do often think of when we talk about occupation as a job. 
But what, uh, what I've found is that if you explain that as occupational therapists we think of occupation as everything that we do to occupy our time, um, such as getting ready to go out, um, going doing a job, any of those different examples, people tend to understand it very quickly. Um, it doesn't take a lot to, to share with people what our understanding of occupation is. And I guess the importance of using the word occupation is um, in our title. Because we are occupational therapists, we really do need to be associating what we do with, with our title so that we can own, own our identity. I guess another thing to think about is that um, quite often we have words that enter our language that people be, can understand after they get used quite frequently. So for example, if any of you are on Twitter and I suggested that you might tweet about some of your thoughts, that uh, should make sense to a lot of people because we now know that Twitter is a social media forum and it's for short messaging. Um, but if, you, if I'd asked you that five years ago, um, it would have made absolutely no sense to you whatsoever. So it's a made up word, but it actually has a general meaning now. Likewise, if I was to say I'm going to Google something, um, 18 years ago Google didn't exist, so we wouldn't know what that meant, but now everyone has a common understanding of what that is. So language does evolve and language does change, and I think we could do that for occupation um, so that we can connect with our own, our own identity. It's also interesting just to have a think about if, uh, if we were to change our name, which I don't think that there's any plans to do this, I have not heard anything, but if we were to change our name, what would be better? So might we say activity therapists or enabling therapists? And I think we might find that we come to the same conclusion that it's actually also going to be challenging for people to know what it is that we do. So while we're called occupational therapists, I think we should embrace the term occupation. You may have also noticed that um, I'm trying to say occupational therapist rather than shorten it to OT. And again, this is part of uh, trying to reinforce our identity. Um, we have enough confusion without making an acronym out of our name. So while I know that it is a bit longer than saying OT, if we start to say occupational therapist, then other people will recognize us as occupational therapists and not perhaps get confused with IT or um, overtime or any other acronym that OT also stands for. So I think that's maybe something to think about is how do we engage um, and think about what our language is saying and how we are advertising ourselves. So there is an explanation um, within the College of Occupational Therapists and we are saying things like occupational therapy improves health and well-being through participation in occupation. So we're trying to give a, a high level, uh, simple definition about what occupational therapy is that is applicable to all different situations, all different services. Um, so as an occupational therapist, we are concerned with promoting health and well-being and the core of that is through occupation. So we might use something that is a little bit more uh, elaborative, so occupational therapy enables people to participate in daily life to improve their health and well-being. Then we can go on to say that daily life is made up of many occupations, such as getting ready to go out, cooking a meal or working. An occupational therapist will help people who may need support or advice if they're not able to do their occupations due to illness, disability, circumstances, or as a result of changes in their lives as they get older. So here we're trying to talk about how occupational therapy is the same across all settings. We are all interested in using occupation and enabling occupation to promote health and well-being. And that occupational therapists, we're not just involved with people who have an illness or a disability, although we are very well known for that. 
but also we can become involved if people's circumstances mean that they're not able to access their occupation. So um, if somebody has um, been uh, is, a, is a refugee or if somebody um, has, has changed their life circumstances so that their occupations are changing. We can also support people as a result of um, changes as they get older and we get older from the moment we're born so it might be that the changes are as a result of transition between primary and secondary school or as a result of transition into the workplace or into retirement. So we, can, we are very good at supporting people through these changes and um, not only when people are ill or have a disability but also if there are, um, we can be promoting healthy occupations um, with, with all people, so maybe more of a public health or a health promotion role. So these explanations, they are going to be featuring um, in some, in a, in a form within um, our publications from the college, so we are trying to slowly um, ensure that all of our documentation and all of our website and everything that promotes us has the same message. Um, and that might be something that is interesting for you to have a think about in your own service is what, what is your literature saying about your service? So what information do you give out to your service users or the people that you're working with? What information is on your website? Do we actually uh, reinforce occupation? Um, is that is that a feature of some of the documentation that we that we are using? Um, because we really do need to use every opportunity to promote what it is that we do, um, not only in our face-to-face -face communications, but also in the things that we um, advertise ourselves and our publicity and our web web pages and things like that. So I just wanted to come on to the position statement from the College of Occupational Therapists. Now the position statement, this is a public document. Um, it is designed uh, so that we can, it, it gives a clear steer as to what the College of Occupational Therapists is, is recommending that occupational therapists do. Um, and this is something that uh, is useful for people to um, perhaps use as a as part of their evidence for their service um, and it's to promote the importance and the value of what it is that we do. So the website address is at the bottom of this slide and um, it's a free resource um, so anybody who goes on our website can access this one. So the position statement, a couple of the key points from this position statement uh, that occupations should be considered a basic need and human right, like eating, drinking and breathing. And that was um, a quote from Dunton in 1919, so he was one of the founding fathers of, of modern occupational therapy. And for me, this really does bring occupation into a different, um, a different realm. If we are saying that occupation is a human right, like eating, drinking and breathing, if we think about people and how they are able to access and engage in occupations, and sometimes I've heard that um, occupational therapy and occupations are a nice thing if we can afford it, or, or something that's a nice addition, but it's not actually um, as a requirement like having self-care needs met and having enough food and water. Um, but this is actually saying that we should be considering occupation along those same lines, so we wouldn't withhold food from somebody, likewise we shouldn't withhold occupation from someone. And we know that um, a form of torture that is used is, um, is, is depriving people of their occupations. So I think that's a fairly powerful statement that we should be advocating within our services that it's not just enough that people um, have their, their meals and their fluids and their air needs met they also have a right to be able to do um, to do their occupations. And the next sentence there goes on to say, there is a renewed understanding of how engagement in occupation is therapy and fundamental to health and well-being. And that was by Anne Wilcock in 2006. So we do understand that occupation is 
important for health and well-being and if you have a lack of occupation or an imbalance in occupation um, then that is going to have an impact on your health and well-being and likewise if you're doing things if it's in that doing that we are going to have an impact on our health and well-being. So the next point on the slide is saying that the focus of the practitioner in any setting with any service user group is to maximise occupational performance and participation. And that's from the World Federation of Occupational Therapists in 2012. So that is reinforcing for us that actually occupational therapists are the same. So whatever setting we're in with any service user group, our focus is on occupational performance and participation so it doesn't matter where you're working or how you're working that should always be, be your focus as an occupational therapist. So I just want to go on now to um, the occupational therapist, uh, the College of Occupational Therapists briefing on occupation centre practice. Now a briefing is a member resource so it is written with a different language in mind so it's written for occupational therapists and this is to support occupational therapists to understand and reflect on their own practice so it's not necessarily something that's going to make a lot of sense to um, others who aren't occupational therapists. So within this document it goes into a bit more detail about what do we mean by being occupation centred in our practice. And this has come from the work of Anne Fisher who published an article in the Scandinavian Journal of Occupational Therapy in 2013 which is occupation centred, occupation focused, occupation based, same, same or different. And she argues that actually we need to be clear in the terms that we're using and we need to have a consistent understanding of these terms so that it can, we can support our own practice and understand what it is that we're doing. So you might think that these terms are interchangeable, that they can be just used, used uh, whichever and it doesn't really matter. But Anne Fisher argues that occupation-centred is kind of the umbrella term. So occupation-centred describes an approach where occupation is at the core and it's made up of occupation focused and occupation based practice. So the two parts of occupation centred practice are occupation focused and occupation based. So when we talk about occupation focused practice, this describes practice where information about the person, environment and occupation relates closely with the occupational performance. So occupation focused might be when we are talking about occupation with, our, with the people that we're working with. So in an initial interview you might be asking, so tell me about your typical day or typical week. Tell me about the things that you're managing, tell me about the things that you're finding a bit more challenging at the moment. So when you're asking and talking about occupation, that would be occupation focused. So your focus is on the occupation. If we're thinking about occupation-based practice, this describes practice where the doing of occupation is the main ingredient in assessment, intervention and measure of outcomes. So this is where the occupation, the person is actually doing an occupation. So they might be, um, they might want to make a cup of tea, so therefore um, the assessment is observing them making their cup of tea and then uh, changing things so that they can uh, improve in the way that they're making a cup of tea and then measuring the outcomes, can they now make a cup of tea. So it's about the doing of the occupation. So what's quite interesting is that sometimes within our practice it's just um, might be quite useful for you to have a think about what, what do you do that's occupation focused so think about um, somebody that you've worked with recently or someone you've worked with in the past. Think through each of the steps of what it is that you were doing and how much were you talking about occupation and how much were you doing occupation with them or they were doing their occupations and you were supporting them to do that. So it's not saying that one is, is, is more important than the other um, and that you really probably need to be doing some of both. But sometimes what we find is that many people um, perhaps have 
a lot of focus in one or the other um, and, and maybe having lots of occupation focused um, uh, as part of your service, lots of talking about occupation, maybe that's um, not the most effective way of actually uh, supporting somebody to change. Because obviously as an occupational therapist we're all about um, managing and, and supporting change. So just to go through, so that one is available um, again on the College of Occupational Therapists briefings page. Um, that one you do need to be logged in um, as a member in order to access. So I'm just going to go through a little bit more detail about occupation focused and occupation based. So if we're talking about occupation focused, this is where, um, for example, an initial occupation focused interview is used to understand the occupations which are important and make up a person's routine. Like I said, questions might include, tell me about your typical day or week, or can you manage, what things are you finding challenging to do? The important thing is that occupation should remain proximal to the discussion. So for example, if you were discussing, uh, if the conversation moves on to the illness or disability or events or the environment, you need to be making sure that it's actually related to how they do their occupation. So for example, how is the depression impacting on the person's ability to get their children ready for school? So if the focus becomes the depression, for example, then you're becoming condition focused. So um, if you're talking more, if you're talking only about the environment, so what's your house like, what are the stairs like, what's the bathroom like, then you're becoming environment focused. So when you're talking about occup being occupation focused, the occupation really does need to remain um, very close in the discussions. So constantly talking about how does the environmental factors, how does the person factors, how do the events, how do the circumstances impact on what it is that the person wants to do or needs to do or is expected to do. So it's about the doing. So I guess one of the things to just, um, one of the, the possibilities for reflection here is thinking about what is occupation focused and also thinking about perhaps what is focused somewhere else. So if you are talking a lot about the condition or the environment, it's about recognizing that that isn't occupation focused, that is maybe condition focused or it's symptom focused. Um, and it's recognizing where the balance is. So how much time are you spending on occupation? How much time are you perhaps spending exploring body functions and structures? So for example, memory, balance, cognition, those, those types of things. Um, so when we're talking about occupation-based, this is where the assessment consists of a person doing an occupation, for example, making a cup of tea in their home. Intervention adapts or changes the way the person is doing that occupation for improved performance. So you might provide a kettle tipper or memory prompts. And evaluation measures how the person is doing that occupation. So can they now make a cup of tea when they want to? So being based in occupation, it's about um, constantly uh, working towards an occupation that's important for the person or that's necessary for a person. So sometimes what we might do is um, we might look at a person making a cup of tea or, or doing a kitchen assessment in a, in a hospital environment, for example. And while they're doing their occupation, what, our, what we're actually looking for is how well are they balancing? How well are they sequencing what they're doing? How well are they remembering what the steps are? Uh, how well are they able to, to um, uh, what is, their, what is their, their grip strength like? So while the person is actually doing the occupation, but what we're focusing on is actually a body function. So that's not necessarily occupation based because it's not that we, we're doing it for a, a different purpose. We're doing it so that we can look at the, the person's body functions and structures and then if um, uh, 
uh, once they've done that assessment, we can then make um, judgments about how it might impact on other areas. So for example, if they're losing their balance while they're making their cup of tea, you might also suspect they're going to lose their balance while they're dressing. They might also lose their balance as they're walking out the door. Now, that's, that, that could be quite useful to do, and I think sometimes we get into the um, uh, we get into the routine <coughs> of being able to look at a person and then assume a relationship with a body function and structure. However, we do need to be a bit cautious about that because we know that when a person is doing their occupations, it's a combination of their own factors, so their person factors body functions, um, but it's also a relationship with the environment and the occupation that they're doing. So just because somebody might lose their balance or not have the right sequence when they're making their cup of tea doesn't necessarily mean they're going to have the same problems if they're, they're doing another occupation because the occupation has changed and also the environment has changed. So we need to be a little bit careful about the assumptions that we make about somebody's performance doing an occupation in one environment um, based just on their body functions and structures. So I'm using those terms, body functions and structures, that's coming from the International Classification of Functioning Disability and Health, so it's the ICF, and that's from the World Health Organization. Um, so if you're not familiar with those types of terms, it might be useful to have a look at that, um, just because what's interesting about their definition of health is that it actually does include participation and activity, as well as the health condition and the body functions and person factors in the environment. So the World Health Organization is also promoting the fact that health is not just about the person and their, their, the things that are happening, their cognition, their memory. It's not just about the internal factors, it's also about what people are doing and the environment that they're doing it. So, the next couple of slides is just going to be a way of um, perhaps supporting a discussion about how close are you focusing on occupation. So how close is occupation within your practice? So this whirlpool, it kind of represents where um, at the apex of the whirlpool it says that this is a proximal focus on occupation, so a close focus. Occupation is very close to what it is that we're doing. And at the top, um, it's where the whirlpool kind of fans out, it's a distal focus on occupation. Now, if we think about what the purpose is of um, other professionals within the health or social care education services, um, we might be thinking, for example, a doctor. And if we think about a doctor, their focus is on medication to reduce symptoms but they eventually want to enable participation. So they eventually want to enable occupation. The reason that they want to get the person well is so that they can live their life, so that they can do what it is they want to do. If we think about a physiotherapist, they may focus on gait training to enable walking, but they're wanting somebody to walk so that eventually they can do their occupations and they can participate in life. So we need to be a little bit careful when we're saying, well, occupational therapists focus on occupation, because it could be argued that there are a number, like most, if not all of the other professionals, are also wanting to uh, somebody to be able to live their life. I mean, that is the ultimate purpose for, for everyone. But what makes occupational therapy potentially different is how close is that participation to what it is that we're doing? So you'll notice that the doctors, it's, it's quite a distal focus on occupation. So their, their proximal focus might be on symptom reduction. It might be on in, um, medication to improve some kind of aspect of the body function. And then eventually, when that is all working, then they'll be able to get to occupation. Or a physio, they might be working on muscle strength um, and in different ways and then doing a graded walking program and then eventually they will get to the point where they can actually be um, using that to participate. So if we think about an occupational therapist, 
if we have a focus on getting washed and dressed because the person wants to and needs to get washed and dressed, then um, our, our focus on occupation is really very close. So what it is that we're doing, we're assessing how a person might get washed and dressed at the moment and then we are putting in place supports or, or different strategies or techniques or grading the occupation so that the person can get washed and dressed. But our very close focus is about getting them washed and dressed. What we might see though is that if as an occupational therapist we focus on some other aspect in preparation for occupation, so if we focus on um, perhaps a piece of a, uh, a equipment like a chair, we focus on somebody's posture. So if we go in and we think, well, this person needs to have 24-hour postural management, um, our focus becomes on the postures that the person is having across the day, and that's a step before the occupation. So we've, we've placed another step in there between, um, between what we're doing and the occupation. So we kind of move up the funnel a little bit. Um, and or if we decide that actually somebody needs to improve some range of motion or some or um, thinking about a mental health example, if somebody needs to manage their anxiety in order to then be able to do their occupation. So if we're focusing on the anxiety management, then we're moving up the funnel. So the more we move up the funnel, the more we move away from occupation or we do things that are in preparation for occupation, the more we are often overlap with other professions. So you might get a situation where um, you could be doing the same thing as a physiotherapist or a psychologist or, or somebody else in the team or your post might be a generic post because a lot of the things are seen as um, that step away from occupation. So in order to bring us closer to occupation, we do need to be thinking, um, again being occupation focused, if, if the person is incredibly anxious and they can't go out to the shops, our focus is getting them to be able to go out to the shops and we might grade that, we might give them some anxiety management strategies so that they, um, but we do that within that occupation of getting ready to go out to go to the shops. Um, so we don't necessarily want to be giving them lots of different strategies in a, in a different scenario and expect them to be able to translate that to multiple occupations. We really want to be supporting somebody to use the anxiety management strategies as they are getting ready to go out and to go to the shops. Um, so it's keeping the occupation as close as possible but we can use all of those grading activities, we can use all of those different strategies that we are very good at, but we are doing that so that it's very, very close to the occupation, so that they're actually doing that occupation. So it might be worth just having a think about where are some of the common assessments and interventions that you use? Where would you place them on the continuum? So how close are they to occupation and how much are we doing which is perhaps a few steps removed from occupation? Um, I know that a lot of our standard assessments that we use, they often focus at the body function level um, and that can sometimes lead us down a track of trying to improve a body function before we get the person to be able to do their occupation. But what we have to just keep in mind is that we don't want to put too many steps in the way because it's the occupation, as occupational therapists, it's the doing of the occupation that we think is going to improve the health and well-being. Not necessarily does the person have to have everything in place in order to do the occupation. So it's a bit of a different um, set of thinking um, that's required if we are going to be uh, occupation-centred in our practice. So to think about how we actually um, implement occupation within each step of our occupational therapy process, um, again I've been influenced by the work of Anne Fisher and the occupational therapy intervention process model um, and this it has helped me to be able to keep occupation at the core 
at every stage of the process. So a summary of that process um, is in the Occupation Centre Practice Briefing and it goes, um, uh, and, and we're going to go through it on the next slide. I guess first what I'd like to think about though is if we think about the general steps in our occupational therapy process, we might think about um, we have a referral, we do an assessment, we do some intervention and we evaluate. And if we think in those general terms, it might be that actually we're not that much different from say a nurse or a physiotherapist or another professional. So thinking about um, does that actually make any changes, is there anything different from what somebody else might do? And I really don't think that there is. Um, so having those general steps, although it is good to have a process, it does mean that actually we, we don't have a lot to, to hang on in terms of how is occupation central at each of those steps. So that's where the occupational therapy intervention process model comes in. Um, and there is a website addressed at the bottom, um, which is innovativeotsolutions.com. Um, so the first thing is, as with everything, in collaboration with the person, group or community, and obviously with the appropriate awareness of risks. So you, you look at the risks before you go into anything. So the first step would be to identify the occupational strengths and needs. So with the focus is what is important, what are the occupations? And I think sometimes what we do in our initial assessments, we might focus it even on the, um, the initial things that we're asking about, it might be name, address, it might be condition, it might be where do you live. So, so actually just even changing that around so that the first thing that you do is ask about somebody's occupations, it kind of reframes the whole discussion. Um, so that's something that it's, it's possible to do. It might be that you do uh, have to ask about different body functions and that's fine, but maybe focusing first on the occupations, it kind of frames the conversation for you and also the person that you're working with. The next step would be to prioritise those occupations. And this is a really, really important process um, and it's actually quite a challenging thing often to do because um, frequently people come in with lots of different occupational performance challenges. There's a number of lots and lots of different things that we could be focusing on. And if we try and fix all of the problems so that the person is able to do all of their occupations, while it's a nice um, idea, what we might end up doing is overwhelming your, yourself as well as overwhelming the service user um, so that actually they don't get anything achieved because they're just working on too broad um, uh, um, uh, occupations. So it's trying to prioritise the occupations and this might be that the person's um, prioritising it, might be the family, there might be relevant others that are involved. So it might be in a school, it might be the teachers, it might be in a care home, it might be the carers. Um, it, it might also be the services that we've set up. So the priority occupations perhaps when people are trying to get out of hospital might revolve around self-care. So that prioritisation process, there's a number of different factors that will influence it, but it's really important to really hone in on what it is that you want to be focusing on. So once you've got the priority occupations and you assess those priority occupations to find out where things are going well and where things are not going so well. And then the next step is to set a goal. And that's um, in relation to the priority occupation. So if the priority occupation is to be able to feed um, a person's dog, then their goal would relate to feeding the person's dog. Now, reasons for the problems of occupational performance are clarified. This is um, a really important step that I think it, it, we do need to make it more obvious in our occupational therapy process, thinking about what it is that we have um, assessed and how have we interpreted that information and what do we think is the major causes um, of the issues that we're seeing. So that might relate to a person factor, it might relate to the environment or it might relate to how the occupation was being performed. So if we make it very clear why the person wasn't able to feed their dog, for example, if they had 
um, uh, too many tins of dog food there so they couldn't make a choice, then when we talk about our interventions, then we will be able to be very explicit about why we are suggesting we reduce the amount of choices of the dog food tins. Because making that link between what we think is the causing the issue and what we actually do about it is really, really important. So then we can reflect, if it doesn't work, we can go back and say, well, maybe the reason that we suggested first up isn't the right one, we might need to try something else. So this is really important um, not only for um, experienced uh, occupational therapists and what I found the more experience you've got the more you do this in your head the more you do it internally and the less perhaps you do articulate it um, because you have that experience but what we find is if we have students or junior members of staff who are trying to work and, and um, see how you're doing things, they don't see that reasoning in, in your head um, and they might try and mimic what it is that you're doing um, and that's where you can get into a recipe book approach. You've seen this particular issue so then you always do this particular intervention so you have that jump. Um, so that reasoning, I think, is what it, it, it's so important and it does really separate us from um, what it is that perhaps other people do or, or occupational therapy assistants might do. It's that reasoning that's, that's really so important. So as I mentioned, the intervention will then enable that engagement and performance in the occupation. So you, you address what it is that you think is the reasons for those problems in your intervention. And then you evaluate, and it's so important to evaluate um, in relation to perhaps satisfaction, engagement, occupational performance, participation, well-being. Um, it's really important to uh, have some kind of measure of if anything was successful. Um, quite often what we find is that when services are stretched, one of the things that does get left, um, left off is the uh, evaluation, is the outcomes. Um, and that's, that's going to be a challenge because if people are asking you to prove your service and you don't have any outcomes, then it's going to be very difficult for, for, for you to prove that service. And also you need to know that what it is that you're doing is actually making a difference. Otherwise you could get into a situation where you continue to, to suggest your interventions and it may not be working. Um, and that's actually, um, it's, a, it's a waste of, of your resource, it's also a waste for the, for the people that you're working with. So having that outcome measurement is really so important and I guess the first um, minimum would be that has the goal been met. So if you're setting the goal, um, you, you would obviously review the goal and then there are going to be other outcomes that you can, that you can also measure. So perhaps um, uh, at a team meeting or in a discussion with some peers, you might think about um, how these steps relate to your occupational therapy process. And maybe what tools and techniques do you use at each one of these steps? And thinking about how proximal is occupation within this step, within each step. And just another important point, um, is how this is all reflected in your documentation. Um, so people understand what it is that we do by observing what we do and also by reading about what we do. So if in our notes that we're recording, if in our reports we're talking about occupation, we're talking about how we are supporting somebody um, to do their occupations, then it will reinforce for everybody that actually that's our focus. Our focus is around the occupation. Um, so it is really important and I think documentation really does change practice. So um, if, if written on reviewing your documentation you can have that occupation focus in there, um, it, it really does frame things in a different way. So just to finish off some discussion and next steps, so again just some questions that you might want to discuss with your, um, within your groups. Um, is what are the strengths within your current service related to occupation centered practice? And perhaps which areas could be further developed in relation to occupation centered practice? And part of that is just being really explicit about which bits are you actually focusing on occupation and which bits are perhaps focusing elsewhere. 
And there might be very, very good reasons. Um, so services might be designed so that you have to be doing stuff that isn't occupation-centered. Um, and that, that is, um, that's a reality which I think is important to acknowledge. However, if we go back to the point about occupation is as important as eating, drinking and breathing, if you're not doing the occupation, then um, who, who else is going to be able to do that? And actually, doing the occupation is going to have an impact on health and well-being. So the people have a right to have that as well as whatever it is that, that our attention has been focused away from. Um, there was a nice thing um, that was mentioned fairly recently, um, and this has come out of Wales, where um, there is a, 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 a statement about only do what you can only do. So I think it's very important that you as occupational therapists are trained in occupation. So we need to make sure that people are experiencing the full benefit of occupation. Um, and then if we have time, we can do the other things that we get drawn into. However, if we get drawn into things at the expense of occupation, then again, there's nobody there to pick up that really important piece. So it's about making um, a justification for occupation isn't just nice if we have time. It's actually a really vital part of, of somebody's health and well-being. So there are many, many challenges associated with this, I'm sure, but um, one of the things that um, it might be useful to think about is having a um, community of practice, so getting together with um, colleagues who have similar, um, similar interests so that you can discuss some of these things. Um, and, and through talking and through discussion and through problem solving together, I think it does help to overcome some of the challenges um, I'm very much an advocate that um, people, we, we do need profession-specific supervision and if that's not available internally within the organisation then it might need to be accessed externally um, and if that can be written into professional contracts I think that's really important. Um, but if that's not possible then at least getting together with other occupational therapists and having peer support I think is really, really vital. So, um, and the College of Occupational Therapists, they do have a number of publications around supervision and we also have um, our groups, our regional groups and our specialist sections. So we are trying to support occupational therapists through those groups um, to be able to uh, develop some of their ideas and practice and really take these ideas forward um, when we know that it is quite challenging because people might be feeling quite isolated. So having a think about how these challenges might be overcome and how we can take these messages forward. So there's plenty of information that's available on our website, which is cot.co.uk. Um, I would really just like to thank you all for listening. And if you'd like any further details, then please contact me at the College of Occupational Therapists. And my email address is there. Um, this uh, presentation, all of the parts of the presentation are actually contained in the briefing and the position statement. So I would really encourage you to use those as, a, as official documents when you're talking about this kind of, um, this kind of practice. And, and please do share this with, um, with your communities. Um, as well. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you Karina, that was a really interesting talk and um, I think it's given everybody lots of food for thought having read that. So that just leaves me to wish you all um, a good rest of your day and thank you Karina for delivering today's session. Thank you. Thanks.